feeling ahead. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, a very warm welcome to all of you, for, uh, those joining us from the comfort of their, uh, their homes or those who are actually in, uh, in at, uh, cam at campus somewhere or in a hospital or surgery somewhere. Welcome. So, for those who are not um, familiar with these Leading Lights series, it is the name brand we use for our inaugural lectures. So all professors, you know, will give it. Uh, have an opportunity to give a lecture, which is a lecture like no other. It's not like a lecture on your, you know, favorite subject matter. It is, it is much more personal. And we and for us, I always find I learn much more about the person, their journey here, and uh, and 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 how they got to uh, to this this point. So it's always uh, something I find quite illuminating in more than one way. Not only do I learn a little bit about subjects that I know very little about uh, uh, often, you know, but uh, but uh, but also a little bit more about the person. So today's leading light lecturer uh, that we are doing virtually these days is uh, Professor Sorinola. Of course, uh, we are all amongst friends and we know him as Landry. And uh, I wish we were doing it in person because I always love watching his shoes so I'm, I'm trying to imagine what shoe is wearing today and the belt, uh, uh, the little detail. And he was just telling me that uh, he's a shy and retiring person uh, who you know, doesn't have it. Uh, and, and actually, you, you know, that's not what you think if you see uh, Landry in person. <laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, that's so Landry did his PhD at Warwick. Uh, in 2014, and some of his mentors and people who are involved are probably in the audience with us today. Uh, and that's nice to see. And I think one of the difficulties, uh, you know, having a discipline like land race is that many of his peers and, and others who would have loved to watch this live are probably busy doing their day jobs, either as clinicians or as educators. So, uh, but that's why we are recording this. So, uh, if you don't want your face to be seen, you know, switch off your camera. But uh, but you are you are live. You're, you're you're actually being recorded. So that's something worth noting. So uh, I I now I will now pass on to Landre to deliver his leading likes lecture, and uh, it will be really helpful if people switch off their microphones to mute because it makes sure that we we don't have any audio problems. Uh, but over to you, Landry, and uh, we look forward to your lecture. Uh, thank you, Colin. I hope. Uh, thank you, um, Sudesh. I hope you can all hear me, though. And and I can see a couple of faces already in the audience. I saw Leslie. I saw Ed Peel. I saw Colin, and I, you know, I can see my face too. Tim, Emily, and quite a number of others. Thank you all for uh, joining in, and thanks, Sudesh, for the excellent introduction. Well. I am going to talk about um, my background as a urogynecologist and where I've got to, uh, which is probably, you know, not an area many people are familiar with. So I will try my best to simplify it as much as I can. Um, I live in Warwick. Um, I, I always like showing the uh, castle. As, as I say, I've been asking the um, where it comes to buy, but they won't sell it to me, but that's by the by. <laughs> um, so my, my title is Bringing New Life into the World, the Urogynecologist View, because I work as a consultant urogynecologist at uh, Warwick Hospital. And I probably should start with letting you know that whatever I say today, I've also got two, 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 two kids, two, two boys, and they were both born vaginally. So I'm not trying to say that, um, you know, women delivering vaginally leads to a lot of problems. So I thought I would start off with that so that you can know I'm trying to look at it from a supportive point of view. Um, this is a brief overview of what I'm going to aim to cover. A bit about pregnancy and childbirth, then talk a bit about the pelvic floor. What exactly is that pelvic floor that we all talk about? And how does it get damaged? And when the pelvic floor then, then gets damaged, what is the impact on the woman? And how do we aim to reduce that damage? And what are the next steps? Where do I see this going uh, for other people to take on from where we got to in our understanding? 
because it might seem a simple area that we all understand it, but actually there is more to the pelvic floor that meets the eye. Okay. Um, so this is the joy of pregnancy. This is why you want to be an obstetrician and gynecologist because it's very unique. Um, outcome of a healthy mother and healthy baby, the very good endpoints, but we all know that many things can affect the outcome of any pregnancy or childbirth because sometimes you're going to end up with pregnancies that have been difficult or the vagina delivery might be difficult or we might have to assist the delivery whether it's forceps, ventus, cesarean section. So the woman at the end of the day she's not too happy, she might be angry, she might be having problems and difficulties and it's not the most enjoyable experience for her. So how do we try and make this better for women? Okay. And that's why I think we need to focus a lot more on the pelvic floor and understand it better as urogynecologists. So what is our pelvic floor then? Let, let's start with that question. What's, what's that, our understanding of what the pelvic floor is? So I'd like to show you what that pelvic floor is. Because is you got the muscle fibers and connective tissues that comes all the way from the pelvis, that, that comes underneath the pelvis from the pubic bone to the sacrum. That's what that pelvic floor is. It spans that whole area, right from the front all the way to the back. Yeah? It supports all the structures that are herniating through it. So you've got that combination of muscle, connective tissue, the ligaments, uh, all the way. Okay? That's what that pelvic floor is all about. But, and I say a quick but, because the urethra and the vagina and rectum they pass through that area of the pelvic floor. We've created a weakened area in that pelvic floor because they're herniating in that, what I have said with that oval uh, green area, the urethra in front, the vagina in the middle, and the rectum at the back. So that's the weakest point that we've created in the way the pelvic floor is. Okay. Let's look at the muscles. I can quickly give you names of the muscles. This is not an anatomy lecture and I don't want to complicate it, but we've got the three key ones, the puborectalis, the pubococcygeus, and then the ileocosygeus. Those are the three muscles that really span that area and provide that support. Okay. So, we call those muscles the levator A9. And for the rest of the lecture, you probably will just hear me talk about levator, 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 levator A9, because that's how they form that kind of bowl shaped area that you see there with the three structures I need the intro. And you can imagine that bowl, and you can look at it sideways, and we can turn it upside down for us to try and gain that understanding of what that pelvic floor area is. Okay, that hammock effect that it creates. Okay, so we understand that. What about the damage there? Do we understand what happens uh, to the pelvic floor? Let's look at that. The multifactorial reasons why the pelvic floor might get damaged. You can start from genetics. Some people have got connective tissue disease and all that. We can look at gender. Of course, we're talking today about female. And I probably should also say to you a bit of warning that there are some uh, clinical images yet to show you real life what might happen. I tried to use a lot of diagrams, but there are some clinical images as well. We know there are a lot of things that will promote the damage, you know, obesity, smoking, you know, constipation, anything that is putting pressure on the pelvic floor constantly and making it having to uh, stretch. But the key really is pregnancy and vagina delivery. Those are the two key ones that really will cause the damage to the pelvic floor for almost all women, because women tend to go through that. Nine months of pregnancy, and then if they do have that vagina delivery. Okay, so let's focus on those two. We already know what happens to the muscles in pregnancy. I mean, you can see from the pictures on the right, a non-pregnant, yeah, with the rectus abdominis intact. And we can see what happens as the pregnancy and versus you get to that term 36 weeks, 37 weeks, and the muscles get stretched and stretched and stretched further. And that's that we're mimicking that and the effect on the pelvic floor. Because remember, the pelvic floor carries the weight of everything above it. Yeah? Okay. But let's look at what happens during delivery. 
here, what we're going to simulate, we're going to put a sphere to represent the head of the baby. We're going to make that smear, uh, that sphere, about nine centimeters, move through the pelvic floor. I take the pain that the baby's head will take through vagina delivery. And then we're going to measure the stretch of the levator ani muscles as that baby's head moves through. We've done this for a first time, i.e. prime a first baby, to see what happens with that first delivery for, compared to uh, somebody who is non-pregnant. And you can see what happens to the stretch of the levator as we go through this. So it's coming through. Getting further stretch. You can see the centimeters increasing as we get more and more stretch of that. And eventually, by the time the elevators are able to accommodate nine centimeters sphere, you've got at least three or three and a half times stretch of that levators. And that's what happens to the pelvic floor during pregnancy. Uh, and this is what we try to teach the obstetricians to say, you have to understand what is going on. If you take a comparison in this image, it might look quite busy, but it's a very simple thing. On one side, we've got a non-pregnant lady. You can see the bladder. You can see the ligaments all intact. You can see the uterus in the middle, and you can see the rectum at the back with the rectal vagina septum, yeah? Okay, everything all intact. But if we switch to the other half, you can see how compressed the bladder is now. You can see that the uh, fascia gets turned. Yeah, the pubosoeca fascia, it starts to pull and it can snap away from its attachment. The baby's head is coming through at that moment of what we call crowning, when the widest diameter of the baby's head is passing through the vagina. And you can see how tightly stretched the rectal vagina septum is. And of course, the levator inners are already stretched to three, three and a half times their length. And here on the sidewall, where we have the vessels and the pudenda nerve. The pudenda nerve is enough to the pelvic floor, arising from S234 root, uh, sacral uh, root levels. And you can see the compression of that nerve as well. So, let's show you in a much more simpler diagram. Yeah, bladder compression, damage to the bubble cervical fascia, the head is coming through, the rectal vagina septum, yeah, because that's the rectum at the back, and of course the compression. And unfortunately, sometimes as well, as our head is almost coming out, you can see the split going through into the anus sphincter muscle. So we know what happens to the pelvic floor at delivery, and that hammock effect, that's our nice hammock. Attachments are intact, but you see it can break in front, it can break at the back, or it could get torn sideways as well and this is what we need to understand about how the pelvic floor functions and how the damage happens so what do we do when we do for that imaging you could see the disruption of the pelvic floor from its attachment and we could see the damage to the pudenda nerves okay so those are the things that we'll be looking out for let's look at it in more detail this is tomographic ultrasound scan I know this is complex, but if you look at all the three images labeled A, everything is intact at the edges in terms of the attachment. Here, where we put the stars, you could see the detachment. And in the lower picture, we've got bilateral detachment. Okay. So we know that there is definitely damage during vagina delivery. And it's a case of what then happens to the woman once this damage happens. Because we're talking of muscle damage, nerve damage, and what are the outcomes for the poor woman if this happens? Well, the impact on the pelvic floor can be quite worrying because one in three women will end up with a pelvic floor disorder in their lifetime from this damage during pregnancy and delivery. And if you take a comparison of this and compare with, let's take some common things that people will worry about. Uh, let's say uh, breast cancer, for example, yeah, or cervical cancer or ovarian cancer. 
this is commoner than all those, you know, uh, in women, because you're talking about risk that will be like one in 36, one in 71, or one in 155, compared to a risk of one in three. So it is common, but because it's hidden, we don't tend to talk about it. What's the function of that pelvic floor? Its function is to support that whole area and for us to be continent, whether it's urinary incontinence or fecal continence. And also, of course, we need it for sexual intercourse because you contract those muscles and you get the grip. So if you look at it, that those are its key functions, then you can quickly understand what the issues will be for the woman. If you take the bladder in front, you could have urinary incontinence, or she might have voiding difficulties. If you take the bowel at the back, you can have fecal incontinence, or she might get constipation. If you take the vagina in the middle, then you'll be looking at prolapses, where things are now coming down, or she might have sexual dysfunction. So those are the impacts that you tend to get with these problems. I'll just take you through a couple of those impacts so that you can understand it, yeah, a little bit more. Let's take stress incontinence, for example. What's stress incontinence? We've got increasing intra-abdominal pressure and you get the leakage, okay, because the urethra sphincter will open up with that increase in intra-abdominal pressure. The sphincter is no longer closed. When you get that increase, you get that opening and you're going to leak some urine. Okay, with coughing, with sneezing, with laughing, with dancing, with intercourse. Those are the kind of damages. Uh, those are the kind of things a woman will experience. And you can see what I mean by that with lifting. Okay, not all of us are going to be weightlifters. But even with just laughing or joking around or dancing, and it's very embarrassing if you have those accidents. Yeah. So, and people will say, oh, I try my best across my legs, and but I still get the leakage. Okay. So those are the kind of things you're going to get with stress urinary incontinence. If we go to the back, though, that's even worse. It's worse in the sense that while we might have things that we can do to try and correct stress incontinence, we don't have many things that will correct fecal incontinence that easily for us. And how do we get the fecal incontinence? Remember I talked about the anus sphincter because it's very close and it could get split all the way down the middle straight into the anus sphincter and the damage is done. And this is me in theater. The anus sphincter is like a piece of elastic. Once it breaks, it retracts sideways. So you got to pull it together and try and overlap it to try and repair it. And that's what you see me pulling there. We're pulling the sphincter out where it's retracted into to try and get it back into shape and overlap it. And I always say to people, you know, the vagina and the perineum, they're very forgiving in the short term because, okay, we're doing nice repair. It looks good. It looks great. It's all covered up now. But does it heal that way when we go back into it? I spend a lot of my time um, doing uh, and doing an ultrasound during my research, and I can show you what tends to happen. Because when you do repair muscle, you know, you, you're not going to get muscle back. You're going to get fibrosis. That's what you get when you pull those muscles together. And here you can see an endoanal ultrasound. We go through the anus. We put a probe in and we go and look at the sphincter. And the internal sphincter, you know, that's represented with the dark area there. Yeah. But you need the external sphincter, which is striated muscle. That is really the one that keeps us continent because that's the one that contracts to stop leakage of flatus or liquid feces, etc. So this, you see an intact sphincter. But in some of those repairs, we get a defect. And this defect is on the anterior wall here. If we go by the face of a clock, we say 12 o'clock position. So you can see that just by the repair, we get defect in those, and then the sphincter is weakened, and the woman will probably end up with flatus or liquid incontinence or even passive soiling of the underwear and having to wear a pad, etc., etc. So those are the kind of damages we get with the back. What about the vagina itself, though? Prolapses. How common is prolapse? Well, 
We know prolapses are very common. We think one in three women will always end up with prolapse. Um, so it is quite a big one for us as a urogyne person. And we can look at it in various ways. We can look at it, what we say, anterior, middle, and posterior compartment. But those are fancy names that we give them. But simply speaking, when we say anterior, we're looking at the bladder. And you can see in this image, the bladder is in the right position, it's in the pelvis. But if you look on there, the bladder is now sagging all the way downwards. Yeah? So it's now dripping and it's coming out of the introitus. So what you tend to get is a bladder that is out there because it's now out here of the introitus. So again, we can see what happens with these damages. What about with middle compartment, as we like to call it? Well, the middle is the uterus and the cervix. You can see the cervix here where you take smears from, and I'm holding the uterus and trying to return the whole thing back into the vagina because the whole uterus and cervix has come out. Okay, well, what about the back? Again, you can see what we call the recticle, which is the rectum pushing through into the vagina from the back. And this is the kind of thing you get because we're covering the front there, but you can see the back pushing through. So those are the kind of things you get with the prolapses. Okay, what about this one? Sexual dysfunction. I like this one. Because the New York Times has always been asking this question, what do women want? And there's been movies about what do women want? I think we know the answer. Well, we think we know the answer as to what women want. I think they want to feel desirable. And when you feel that desirable, it will create a desire and then sex will be good. But with pelvic floor injury, what tends to happen? There's a lot of vagina pain. The tears might not have healed well. There might be a lot of scarring. They lose the vagina tone, the strength of that pelvic floor, the ability to grip. And if they're breastfeeding as well, you know, there could be dryness, vagina dryness. So a lot to do with lubrication. So if the woman is having all this trouble, you can see here, well, the healing is not good. We get granulation tissue. It will bleed easily during intercourse. So we've got to refashion all that area. So you can see why. When you think women are, well, yeah, making excuses of not wanting sex post-delivery or six months later, still not. I don't think it's always the case. It's because we're not understanding what might be going on and trying to help the woman find the solution to the issues that could be causing those problems. But anyway, I have a secret weapon. If all else fails, extra virgin olive oil. That's my secret. Okay, so move on from here and say, what is the impact on the woman's quality of life, though? Joke aside, it does cause a lot of problems. Not many women who have had vagina deliveries will be able to trampoline with their children. I hear a lot of excuses. Oh, yeah, you carry on. I got a bit of it. I'll join you guys later. Yeah, because they know if they go on the trampoline, run and jump with their children, they're going to leak and wear themselves. Okay, the fear of losing blood or bowel control, having to wear a pad, the type of underwear, it's all embarrassing and it's quite depre depressing. I haven't spoken a lot about the psychological morbidity because we've looked into that as well, but that's a whole day of lecture on its own. I've only got 40 minutes or so. Uh, but these are the things that you get with the woman with the damage to that pelvic floor. Hence why I think we still need to understand and our, uh, our knowledge of that pelvic floor. We need to improve further and try to know what else we can do to help women reduce damage. Okay, we, we can talk prenatally, optimize a woman, make sure she's the right BMI, stop smoking, avoid constipation, straining, et cetera, et cetera. But really what I would like to focus on will be the reduction of pelvic floor damage during pregnancy and delivery. I mean, postnatal is another key area, but let's focus on those two for now. Uh, because an ounce of prevention is, is, is much better than me trying to solve these problems when I see them in clinic at a later date. Okay, I'm not trying to be sexist, but I'm saying that women should try and conceive at a younger age. We generally say around 30, because once you're later on, the risk of prolapses is double. The risk of inner sphincter injury increases. 
and and all these problems will accumulate. I know women will point out to me different things and say, well, um, Janet Jackson, well, she had, yeah, yeah, she was pregnant at 50. She had um, delivered in January 2017, and then the boy is four years old now. But we cannot just use one case study to always use it as the way to advise women. I think around that the age of 30 to try and minimize the risk that we get. But I understand because there's career, there is everything else that might, you know, delay a woman having her children. Avoid excessive weight gain. Okay, let's look at what, what happens with weight gain in pregnancy. Okay, most of the women I will see, I mean, yes, you might have very slim women, size zero almost. Okay, very few in that. Most people will be somewhere around here. 25 to 29.9, then going into the overweight category when we start getting to BMI 30. So, in the general note, I tend to say 7 to 12 kg in terms of kilograms, in terms of the weight gain that we'll be looking at. Otherwise, it gets worse because postnatally, then you've got to try and reduce all that weight on the pelvic floor. So, 7 to 12 um, kilograms. I mean, and if you're a pounds person, well, 15 pounds to 27 pounds, somewhere around there is what. Otherwise, we'll end up with babies like this. Babies that are born ready for primary school, you know, a 14 pound baby. I, I know my team always say, Landry, you got to improve your empathy face because I cringe when I read headlines like this because I'm saying, oh God, all those muscles are detached and the ligaments are gone, you know, when you have this kind of delivery. Okay, what about performing pelvic floor exercises during pregnancy? Another important area. I mean, most people might not know the where this all came from, but American obstetrician Arnold Kegel first published this in 1948 in terms of strengthening the pelvic floor muscles and the tone and the strength and recruiting the right group of muscles, both the fast and the slow duration. So it's quite important, but the issue with pelvic floor exercises is that it needs the commitment, the concentration, and the continuity, and of course, good position for you to be able to do it properly. So that's why most people give up and don't remember doing it. But it's very useful in terms of trying to keep the pelvic floor in good shape. Okay, so we talked about pregnancy. How do we help during delivery then? What can we do? What do we try and teach our obstetricians um, a registrars, etc., and the midwives on labor, what to do? Well, we talk about perineum massage in labor, trying to support the perineum throughout labor because it's very important. And I use the word active here. Yeah, this is when the woman is pushing during labor and say, ah, ah, I'm pushing strongly. You got to try and look at reducing that to about one and a half hours. Otherwise, the stretch on the levators is just too much if you allow her to push and push and push endlessly for hours on end. So active second stage of labor. We should be looking at reducing that to one and a half hours. That's what the studies have shown. And what about if we need to do assisted delivery? Well, the trick to this is very easy. If you look at me here, I've got forceps on the head of this baby. The moment I put forceps on the head of a baby, I've increased the diameter of what needs to come out of that woman's pelvis by 10%. Just the mere act of me applying the two blades to the sides of the head, that's a 10% increase in what needs to come out. I show you the pictures of the levators with a nine centimeter sphere coming through. Now I've increased the size of what needs to come through. So more risk of damage. Hence why we say try the Ventus because this wouldn't increase the diameter and it hopefully will reduce the damage and injury that we sustain. Okay, what else? When we're cutting the episiotomy, this is us, you know, thinking of where should we be cutting. We want to try and avoid midlines. Cutting through here risks us just going straight into the, the tear extending straight into the inner sphincter. So we want to go lateral or middle lateral as much as we can get away with. And also looking at positioning, whether you're standing or semi-recumbent or lateral position, and of course controlling the delivery of the baby's head. I'll show you two pictures here. Here, no support at all. The baby just flies out, and the and, and the shoulders are next to come out once the baby's head restitutes as it turns. But here, look at the number of support to the pelvic floor. Even though the positioning might be similar in terms of semi-recumbent, 
but you're supporting the pelvic floor and slowing down the delivery of the baby's head, again, to minimize the tears that will happen to that vagina and to the pelvic floor. Okay, and of course, repairing those tears, that's part of our job to make sure we make, we, we put them back together to get the best healing out of those areas. So there are people in the audience already that say, no, oh God, why don't we just section everybody? Is there a section? Yes. Okay, fine. Let me just summarize it for you. Uh, we've looked at cesarean section, elective cesarean section, because we know once you've had more than two, 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 two babies, the protective effect of cesarean section tends to disappear. But let's look at it in terms of those things that I've spoken about. Urinary incontinence, how protective it is, mm, to a certain degree, yeah. Fecal incontinence doesn't give others protection. Prolapse, yes, you will get a lot of protection from elective cesarean section. But sexual dysfunction, we haven't found it to be very protective. So the answer is not going to be always an operative delivery for all because this hasn't really been found to do that for us. So what am I saying then? Well, I hope as my legacy, I was chair of the International Urogynecological Association. This is a worldwide association trying to uh, educate women and support women and reduce injury to women. And we ended up producing a public facing uh, web page, www.yourpelvifloor.org for all women to be able to access and their clinicians, their doctors can also access it. We put various information leaflets in up to 25 languages, you know, French, German, English, Hindi, Portuguese, you know, uh, on various topics, stress incontinence, um, inner sphincter injury, fecal incontinence, constipation, pelvic floor exercises, all those topics so that women can read and understand some of these things themselves. So they can talk to their doctors and say, you know, and I'm so proud of this because I think we should do this. I do a lot of public talk uh, for yoga. Uh, where we'll have women from all over the country, wherever country we're having the conference, we have, have a special session with three or four urogynecologists for us to talk to them and explain things to them and show them what happens. And these are always well uh, attended in various places that we've been to. So I'm hoping that the yoga continues doing all these things for the women because I think it's important for us to keep doing this. So you're going to say what next? Do we now have a better understanding? No, I don't think we do still. I think there is still more to be done because I'm looking at my registrars and my trainees, they come into my theater or I see them on labor ward and I'm trying to say, you know, what's, what do you think is happening at this stage now during labor? What do you think is going on to this woman pelvis? And until we start to rethink the problem with a different mind frame, we won't be able to solve the problem, is my view. Uh, cesarean section hasn't solved the problem for us. So we have to start looking at better understanding of that pelvic flow. How do we visualize it? How does the trainee have that pelvic flow in their mind's eye all the time when they're looking at what's going on to that particular woman during that episode? And of course, we're looking at more way of measuring the pelvic flow. This is EMG, electromyography. We're trying to see, because we know the pelvic floor is connected to the thigh muscles and the abdominal muscles. So we lifted this woman up, or she's all attached, and we've got measurements of the pelvic floor going on. Then we're gonna drop her onto the deck, and then she start walking. She start putting strain on the pelvic floor, and we want to monitor the various things that happen. So there are more things that we need to learn as to how that pelvic floor functions. Um, and I'm hoping that that will help us. I don't know. You have to look for it. You see what you look for. You see a, a man with a beard or you see a man on a horse. I mean, you can look very deeply and try and see what is going on here. And I think I'm hoping that I've covered a bit about pregnancy and childbirth. We've spoken a bit about the pelvic floor and how it's damaged and the impact of the pelvic floor damage on women. 
and some of the measures we are taking to reduce it and the educational package as well. But I think there's still a lot more for us to learn about how to help that pelvic floor and to reduce further damage to women. I think this is the end for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Landred. Uh, if I could request uh, everyone uh, who's listening to unmute yourself and let's give a, a, a cheer like uh, you to. Fascinating uh, lecture. I also always thought uh, obstetricians were brave people because I remember going in very excited as a medical student for my first delivery and then coming out completely, you know, uh, scarred for life. I think I was that frightened. So you know, that was <laughs> out, out as a career choice for me since then. But anyway, clearly you're, you're made of tougher stuff. So um, anyway, I think at this point, I would normally present, uh, shake your hand and present a, 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 a memento of this occasion. Now, yeah. uh, in these times, we managed to do everything virtually. So it's been magically transported to, to your office. So yes. I hope you've got it. Uh, I have got it. There you are. Yes. I have got it here. I hope you can see it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so please, and uh, I'm sure you will uh, display it with pride, you know, in your I office. I will, I will display it with pride. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah? Thank you. <laughs> so, um, we customarily don't have questions or Q&A after these lectures. So, uh, and, and, but we would have in normal times gone out for lunch together. But uh, of course, clearly, we've got to do that uh, uh, by ourselves. So, I think. At uh, this point, all that remains for me to say is first, once again, thank you for that uh, really informative lecture, which I'm sure people here would have appreciated. And to thank uh, everyone who joined us. This is recorded and it's still available. So I would say even the students would enjoy listening to that. So I think it's, it's recorded so people can watch it whenever they can. So, okay. Thank you very much. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> if you want to stay and chat with friends and colleagues, you have the opportunity now. I have to duck out. I have a meeting to join to very shortly. So I, I could use another five, ten minutes to prepare for that. So OK, I, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> really good, Lanray. Thank you. Lan Ray. Well done. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank All you, right. Anray. I hope it was useful. I never know what to say with these things. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely good not to be lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> and I assume that we can somehow capture that moment on video where Lanray does do the impression of the woman birthing, and we can use that for all sorts of things. Presumably, that is our, our property now. Um, so, so maybe Claire and others can think about how we can just take that little snippet and use that for everything where, where we feature Lanray in the future. I'll get oh, Megan God. to take a clip. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, I knew something was going to come out of this. This is worrying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lamre, you'll know the ringtone on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think Swedish meant to take the mickey out of me.